afternoon, everyone. My name is Gloria Waswa. I work for Nature Kenya as the membership and marketing manager. Thank you for creating time to join our talk today. I hope our two speakers are ready, Amos and uh, Ramiro. Yes. Okay. I'll just go ahead and introduce the talk and uh, our two speakers. The talk is by Mammal Committee of Nature Kenya. So they'll be leading us today and also helping us to moderate through the talk of today. The title is Why Landscape Connectivity is Key for Conservation. Our main speaker is Amos Chege Mudiuru from African Wildlife Foundation. He'll also be assisted by Craig Ramiro from Smith, Smithsonian, Smithsonian National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. Amos is currently a species conservation officer working with AWF in Savo. Before moving to AWF, Amos worked for Space for Giants and Loisaba Conservancy as a conservation officer between, between 2017 and 2019 and an ecological officer at Soisambu Conservancy from 2011 to 2017. Craigo Ramiro is currently a postdoc student at Samitson Conservation Biology Institute. His work focuses on wildlife, wildlife livestock interactions and animal corridors across the Laikipia Plains. He's gen generally interested in ecology and conservation biology. So Amos, you can now take the lead. Thank you so much, uh, Gloria. And thank you for good introduction. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, <clears throat> we are going to take you through this uh, presentation about uh, modeling landscape connectivity. Our main aim is to inform conservation actions so that we can have wildlife and people thriving in, in the range runs. So uh, in this, presentation, we have divided it into two. There will be my section and my colleague will also uh, do a presentation on some parts. However, in the middle of, of the presentation, I think we will take questions. If somebody has a burning questions, however, we, we, we have time for questions at the end. <laughs> so we'll start with looking at the protected areas uh, in the world and how uh, they are well distributed or they are distributed within uh, the world. And there is a very big uh, uh, insufficiency in terms of uh, protected areas versus the non-protected areas in, uh, in the world. And particularly for the large herbivores, the land for conserving the large herbivores uh, worldwide is becoming smaller every day. And this is a classic, uh, and Kenya is a classic example where we have smaller protected areas with few wildlife compared to non-protected areas, which in this case we'll be referring to them as either private lands, communal lands, or conservancies or communal, uh, communally owned lands uh, as, we talk, as we go through this talk. These lands that are outside the protected areas normally referred to as range lands have shown a very big overlap between, uh, between the range lands and protected areas in terms of wildlife. Most of the wildlife actually overlap between, move between protected areas and non-protected areas. Some even go to agricultural areas and as well as loitering in urban areas as we have seen in some cases. So these range runs are very critical in terms of uh, protecting the diversity and abundance of the wildlife in Kenya. This uh, private or communal uh, land wildlife coexist. They're very critical in terms of of wildlife and they need an attention because they not only form the connecting critical landscape, they also reduce the pressure on the protected areas during seasons 
or in certain seasons, and also enhance the gene pool between the species at different uh, areas, as well as providing critical economic benefits to the local communities. These conservancies, these uh, privately owned or uh, communal areas where wildlife uh, integrate freely with livestock have been designated for the purpose of compatible animals. And therefore, the law in Kenya recognizes that particular uh, compatible land uses, which in most cases is livestock and wildlife. In the Wildlife Act, it is recognized as a way of uh, generating income. And their benefits or the income they generate, uh, and this is just a, a single case of Masai Mara, where we have seen millions uh, of Kenyan shillings paid to the ranchers or to the landowners and employing huge numbers of, of, of people, both uh, from the local areas where the community reside with wildlife, as well as outside the protected, I mean, outside the, 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 the areas of locality. However, these areas have been faced by quite a number of challenges. And one of the key challenges is fragmentation of these habitats. And the fragmentation of these habitats have led to quite a number uh, of issues, and one of it is conflict, as well as land subdivision that is causing huge tracts of land to be subdivided into small portions, leading to increased uh, conflicts. Another issue is agricultural development. As the population of the country continues to increase, we have a big challenge in maintaining that population in terms of food. We need to produce. And therefore, we continue to encroach areas that are closer to the protected areas, or that are range runs that are maybe set aside for livestock. We continue to encroach them every now and then. The results have been a competition for resources, where human beings want food, livestock want grazing areas, and wildlife need some water and other resources within those particular rangelands that they have used for many years. That has resulted to increased conflicts in most of these places, and wildlife has been found on the losing end. However, different approaches have been taken to ensure that wildlife continue to thrive. And one of the things that have been done, and which is a big challenge, is fencing. Most of the fences have been erected in areas next to protected areas, such as Masai Mara in this case. And the results have been very detrimental, leading even to the collapse of some of the greater ecosystems. So we need to reevaluate and look at how we can coexist with wildlife and identify the key areas that wildlife continue to use. So in our case, we took Laikipia Plains or the Laikipia County as our study area. And this presented to us a very unique scenario where people and livestock coexist. We also have small scale farmers who are living adjacent to some of these protected, or I mean to some of these ranches. And this range land actually supports the second most urban wildlife community in the country of Tamara. So these plains actually have got different land use. And one of the key land use within those plains is wildlife only protected areas, like in the case of uh, that old yogi. And we have ranches that are practicing both ranching and wildlife. We also have <coughs> Uh, specific ranches that only practice ranching, which is basically having livestock in their places. And we have pastoralist areas that are areas next to all these ranches or adjacent to these ranches where pastoralists move freely with their livestock that, um, or rather mixing with wildlife as they move across these landscapes. So our first goal in looking at the connectivity 
was to understand the trends in large herbivores occupancy and species richness across these branches. And I will invite my colleague to dive in a little bit on how we did the analysis of those landscape and uh, occupancy models. And then I'll take the next. Welcome, Emilio. Thank you, Emos. Can you hear me well? Yes. OK. So yeah, as Amos said, like a little bit before we dive into the story of analyzing connectivity for Lake Kipia, uh, a step before that, when we started working in this landscape, was to try to understand the like, temp spatio-temporal dynamics of these large herbivore species in occupancy and species richness. And with occupancy, I mean, what is the probability that you will find at least one individual of that species at certain location. And when the species richness is at that location, how many species are present. And so to understand that, uh, Amos, can you pass to the next one? What we did was we got access to this area of uh, the survey data set from the Kenyan Department of Sur Resources Survey and Remote Sensing. Uh, for, for 20 years. I'm not going to get into the details of this, but when I looked originally to the raw data set, I was looking at the, the, the total number, so that species richness for each of these transects, and it was particularly low. Like if, if you know the landscape, you know there are more than four species in these conservancies uh, at, at any year. So it's clear and it's well known that aerial surveys have these problems of detectability. So when you're flying, many times happens that the species, the animals are not available where you are looking or that you, they are hiding under bushes and you don't see them and you miss a lot of animals. It some, seems surprising, but there's really good evidence of this. So here we took an approach to try to use some statistics to try to account for that problem of detectability and also to incorporate rare species. So those species that generally don't have enough detections to incorporate into analysis. So taking a community approach analysis in these models, we can integrate all that data to have a better approximation of the, or be, yeah, approach better the truth, true values. Amos, the next please. So here you can see that after applying this uh, statistical techniques, we obtained better mm -hmm. estimates of a species richness. And that's the, the map you see with the green bubbles there. So that was a better representation of the, actually wildlife is distributed across the landscape. Next, please. Some of the interesting results here was, but we didn't observe big trend changes or dynamics in species richness across time. But what we did observe was this uh, segregation of different numbers of species across the different land uses. And so as expected, the lower amount of animals were, or species were in pasteurized lands, then ranchings and more in ranching and wildlife and wildlife only areas. However, and the next Amos, in, what we observed in pastoralist areas, what, there was high variability. What this means is that it's true that certain pastoralist areas are highly uh, overgrazed and then livestock competes with the species and you don't find them there. But there are other pastoralist areas where you observe a lot, lot of the species and even comparable to ranching and wildlife properties. So the, the whole message here is that not all the pastoralist lands are totally degraded. There are certain areas that are good for coexisting with wildlife and they are super important in this regional landscape to maintain a, wild, a good white or healthy wildlife communities integrated with the people that historically live there with the livestock. Next, Amos. And we use different explanatory variables to try to understand these dynamics. And the most important one was, of course, livestock abundance, what you see in the x-axis there. And as this across different years, we always, always observe that when you increase livestock abundance, you decrease the number of species present. D. 
the analysis that now Amos is going to continue telling you. So pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Ramil. A second objective was to integrate that data obtained from occupancy model and species richness with key species data from, or rather from the CORA data that we obtained from some of the stakeholders in this publication. And we integrated that with the idea to identify <clears throat> priority areas that we need to restore for connectivity for the large herbivores. So that was the main aim to identify those areas that are priority for conservation and are key to the connectivity of this uh, landscape. So we used different methods to achieve our goals. And uh, one of it is what we call all possible pairwise connection of animal movement, which is a circuit skip model, which basically mimic the electricity theory. Uh, and that is the movement of, uh, of the, uh, I mean, of electricity within a circuit. The other thing that we used uh, is what majority of you may be aware or could have used, which is the least cost path models for the animals, which is the shortest cumulative cost weighted distance between areas of interest, which is calculated against a resistance surface. And I'll discuss about the resistance surface. And then we used the barrier mapper to identify areas that need to be restored they either connect key areas or they are part of the connectivity corridors for the wildlife. So our first step was to map out or to map out fences within Laikipia and identify what type of fences exist within uh, Laikipia. And one of the key fences, which actually um, the main one in Laikipia is this type of fence, the porcupine fence. We also identified another fence, the tall fences. The photo is there to see the type of fence we are talking about. And we also identified the tall netted fence that don't even allow small animals to cross. We also had ditches within the county. Uh, and we had uh, the cattle fences, which are normally fences used for paddocking. Like in, in livestock production use paddocks. So those are the kind of fences we identified. In total, we mapped approximately a thousand kilometers of fences within the Kipia County. Second, we mapped the entry and exit points or connecting corridors between these uh, key areas. And as you can see with the black dots, they're just areas that we identified to, to have these certain uh, openings that allow wildlife to move between one conservancy or one area to the other. Then we took the data that Lamiro has already explained and we created uh, a resistance surface now, which is the land use cover within that area, which is the main activities within, or rather the, the anthropogenic activities uh, within the county, which we assume that there will be less movement of wildlife within those areas simply because they are settled or they have higher disturbances. And then we, uh, we added the fences into that model for modeling the multi-species. And then we used four key species, that is the elephant, the giraffe, the gravies, and the common zebra to validate the resistance layer. And this is this is the data that we obtained from, uh, from our partners. And this data was just to confirm that the areas that we identified as the key areas of wildlife movement are varied. And uh, our result was the same for multi-species and individual species. What these uh, maps are showing are just the areas that have got the great connectivity or that need to be restored as most of the wildlife move within or between those particular areas. Importantly to note is that the thickness of the lines, like for example here and here, shows the importance of those 
key corridors. And the dark areas in these maps actually show uh, the areas that have low importance uh, in cases of identification because they are either resistant, highly resistant to movement, they are oversettled, or there is a huge number of barriers or, or activities that make those areas not really suitable. And uh, basically, that is just what I, I explained. The thickness of the lines, of the red lines, shows the important areas. So from there, we had to identify the core areas that need to be linked by these uh, circuits. The areas are the ones highlighted as the core areas in this map, and you can see them. Then we used the barrier mapper again to identify where are these barriers that are making this uh, circuit or this connectivity uh, not to be complete. And some of these barrier mappers, or rather the barrier mapper identified to as very key areas of high connectivity, like we've seen, uh, where we have high abundance of white light. And all these areas were identified as key to movement. Areas with the I don't know what you call this color anyway, could be brown, um, were of higher importance for restoration. And importantly here to note is, is about the connectivity between the old Pegeta Conservancy here, Ilad Downs, and uh, ADC Mutara, which is critical to the connectivity of this landscape. And we are all aware of the fences existing and the human activities that take place in that particular area. So this particular map are also identified for us the connectivity between uh, Lewa Borana towards like Kipia as a key important zone. In essence, these are all the areas that need to be critically, I mean to be critically restored for the wildlife to move across as we have validated that using the CORA data. In conclusion, we need to understand the interplay between wildlife, human population, and livestock abundance in able, uh, uh, for us to be able to make a uh, decision and take conservation management actions. We, uh, this data has already shown us that the relative high relative abundance of livestock can lead to decline in wildlife population and species richness. And therefore, we need to strike a balance between the two activities. For us to maintain a functional heterogeneous uh, landscape. The other key area is that the wildlife, the wildlife friendly areas where wildlife herbivores have access to reserve forage during the season. You find most of these uh, wild animals move in between uh, these ranches based on their seasons. And it has also been identified some of these places go as far as the Siolo and uh, Samburu areas where they go for grazing during different seasons. And therefore, we need to create all these wildlife friendly areas for conservation. <clears throat> therefore, balancing the goals of conservation against those of livestock production is key. And of course, maintaining the pastoralist area does not only support the local communities, but also supports uh, the rangers that sustain wildlife in those particular areas. We need to ensure a well-connected landscape. Sorry, uh, Moskadi, let, let me just interrupt you. Yes, your, please. Your voice is fading, so kindly just try and stay close to the mic. OK, sorry for that. Yeah, OK. You can hear me well now? Yes, if you can stay around that position, I think it will be good. Okay, fine. Yeah. Sorry for that. So the first <clears throat> trade-offs that we need to think about is uh, how do we maximize connectivity and we reduce the cost of human wildlife conflict. And this is very critical because we need all these areas for wildlife existence. The second trade-off is creating connectivity across conservancies 
where we ensure coexistence of wildlife and pastoralists and their livestock in these areas. I'm not sure <clears throat> whether somebody, an intruder, is attacking that, but I see some funny, funny things on my screen. Gloria. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, but I think there is some some attack on the presentation or something. Some? I think somebody could have joined uh, a malicious element. <laughs> ah, okay. Let me try and see what we can do from our end. Yeah. Okay, just proceed. Yeah, I can't move. You can't move? Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, I'm stuck. So <laughs> I have to... Yeah. I think it, I'll have to stop sharing for a while and then I can share back. Yeah. So, yeah. I think someone took control of the on your screen. Yes, I, I think so. Yeah. Just try to reshare again. Yeah. Be able to see that? Yes, I can see. Good. Yes. <laughs> Hello, sorry. Uh, we can see, but they need the somebody to us to disable the, the 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 pointer. I can see somebody is like uh, activating the pointer, so I'll just tell him uh, direct to disable it. Sorry. You can continue. Okay. So. The future directions to this work is to look at the regional connectivity between this key landscape that we are talking about here. This single elephant that is colored by space for giants have shown the need to connect Laikipia, Isiolo, and Samburu counties. And there are even more data that shows greater connectivity than this. So we need to expand also the scale of our analysis to continue to identify the key areas that wildlife uses within Laikipia and Samburu uh, habitats. The integration of aerial surveys, occupancy models, and connectivity analysis has shown to provide critical information that can support important management decisions. And that is not only in the identification of the key areas, but also in mapping the areas that need to be restored within uh, the landscapes. Uh, people here can, this, this, is, this is an extra website where people can, or managers can be able to interact freely with the information that is already analyzed and is provided by Smithsonian there. So that website, my colleague is going to post it here so that people can also uh, get access to it and can interact with the information as much as they want. This is a presentation that was done uh, by the authors of this paper, uh, Dr. Dino Martins from PALA, and was presented to the Laikipia Conservancy Association, highlighting the importance of the areas that we identified that need to be restored and that are important to conservation. And this Laikipia Wildlife Conservancy Association is now coming up or coming together to form uh, the great left. There were some other initiatives like joining Loisaba, Mpala, and all the way to Olpegeta as key areas uh, in what we used to call the Ewaso ecosystem. So there are landscape uh, level measures and actions that have been taken to ensure that all this land is well maintained and connected. 
However, last but not the least, we've got a concern that was raised here. And this is uh, Dino Martin saying, he's pleased that in terms of scientific output for the first time in Pala history, Kenya authorship or co-authorship of the publication has passed 50% which is a very big challenge to us as young generation and people who understand uh, conservation and who would like to be much involved in conservation, that we need to indulge ourselves in this kind of modeling and much more science so that we can be able to, to generate information that we can also be able to adopt as wildlife managers, as communities, and be able to, to ensure that these lands are also connected within either our community uh, our community areas or in our protected areas. However, we still have the challenge of, of publications. We have a problem that most of the work that is done uh, in Kenya or even in Africa is being published outside uh, this place or outside Kenya in Africa. And even the publishers who are coming out from Africa, their papers are far much likely to be published in the recognized journal. So it's a challenge to us to start thinking widely and uh, more collaboratively with other young people, young generations who are the future managers of these landscapes. And with those comments, I think that's the end of our presentation. We are really grateful for your attention. We did spend a little less time for presentation, hoping to get more questions and we can be able to provide the answers, I and my colleague. Otherwise, I'm grateful for your attention and I look forward to further engagement in this. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, uh, Amos and uh, Greg, for the incredible talk. Uh, I think it's time now, uh, if someone has a question, I think we can post the questions to them and probably they can answer. So if you have a question, maybe you can raise your hand or um, you can send it in the chat. Mm. Stop sharing. Yes. I think I can stop sharing that. Okay. I think Sharon has the hand up. All right. So Sharon, can you unmute yourself and uh, ask the yes. question? Yes. Good afternoon, um, everyone. And thank you for that great talk, uh, Dr. Crego and Amos. Good job. Thank and you. Uh, yes, it's it's great to see the work that you're doing, and that's that's really that's really good information. I I just had a question about the fluctuations over the years on the wildlife ranches, and as to why that could possibly be. I noticed that 2010 was especially low in terms of species. Um, was it biodiversity or richness? So I just want to find out if that is something that was throughout the different types of land uses that you saw in Lakipia, or was there something specifically happening with the wildlife ranches at that time? Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. That's a good question. I, I think that was related to the, we didn't specifically look at what was explaining those variations in abundance across years, but I think that was related directly to the big drought that happened in 2009. Uh, that probably had a big impact in the amount of wildlife and livestock left on the, on the landscape. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and then uh, I think there is uh, a request in the chat from uh, Jared. He's asking, uh, could Ramiro walk everyone through the Shiny app and I like its functionality? I don't know how easy uh, that is. Um, yeah, so I thank you, Jared. Um, I just posted there the web. I can actually, if you, if I can share my screen very quickly. Let's see this one. So you can 
do this yourself and I invite you to take a look at it. It may take a few seconds to open depending their internet speed. But here what we did is try to put these uh, results in a way that with the main idea that the owners of the different properties can go and, and look, say zoom in the map and look at the different, look at different years. So we can look at 2010, it's true that was lower abundance. And then you can also query here, okay, if I want to know more or less how much livestock we, uh, I have in a transect of 10 kilometers, then what will be the expected species richness? Oh, I got disconnected there. Probably having too much internet for the, mm -hmm. for the sharing the screen and also running this. But then you have another tab with the connectivity information. Where you can look at the maps. So the restoration, I, so the idea that managers can go here when they are in a meeting and say, well, these are the areas that we can prioritize for maintaining connectivity or increasing connectivity across the landscape. So if we see that we are the, the, here, the east is being disconnected from the center. So we probably need to increase connectivity in these regions, or maybe here in Mui with these big fences, increase the number of corridors or the animal passes if, if you have rhinos. Now, for example, Loisaba has created a new fence here because they, have, um, they are introducing rhino. So of course you need to protect those rhinos from poaching, but you don't want to like keep like fragmenting the landscape. So increasing those amount of animal corridors will be important. And what Amos was explaining here is super important because you have solio that's already completely isolated. And now our pegeta is starting to have the same problem. They used to have more animal passes that have been forced to close more and more. So these are areas where people can put, like managers can put attention and focus on how we maintain connectivity here. And there are, I saw a question about there, how feasible is to do this? And well, it's probably a lot of challenges and Amos explained there, this trade-off we have to think about, like we need the, the, the West, the West like keep your elephant fence because we need to protect the people like uh, growing crops here to uh, like avoid elephants going there and raiding crops. But we cannot continue. We should try to avoid like the amount of fences that are being increasingly put in the landscape. And so we don't keep limiting the movement of these animals because we will have in the long term huge impact on the population dynamics or how viable those populations are. I invite you to play around. You can also change here the species and see how the connectivity map changes. So you get access to basically all that information there. And if you want to access the papers, you can click on the links here and, and you have access to the, to the papers if you're interested. So we, we, we can make them open access that way. All right, hope that all right, I hope um, that answers uh, like your question, like uh, on how to use the Shiny app. Uh, there is another question in the chat by Dr. Njuguna. Uh, he's asking, what is the possibility that the corridors will be created and are there legal matters to be considered with this? Amos, do you want to take that one? You, you were. Uh, yes. <laughs> First of all, um, there is possibility, as I mentioned, on, on, uh, on the map that those conservancies that form part of that connectivity corridors are coming together to form uh, one kind of an ecosystem. So there is a possibility that the corridors will be created if they still maintain that trajectory. About the legal matters to be considered, I know there is, a, there is a publication on the Kenya corridors. I can't remember the full title, but there is a, a document um, which discusses the Kenya corridors uh, of wildlife between protected and non-protected areas. But in the law, I'm not very sure whether that is very well protected, but conservancies as they form part of these corridors, 
then they are considered in the wildlife act. So if we continue creating more conservancies, be it communally owned or private, then we abide by the Kenya laws that dictate the formation of such areas. However, I am not so sure about uh, the, the corridors, um, about any law specifically talking about the corridors. Perhaps it's something we need to dig deeper about. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I hope uh, uh, that answers your question. Uh, maybe for me, I had uh, a question too. I was uh, like, you showed the different types of fences that are within like Kipia. So I was just wondering like, uh, uh, could there be a difference in the effects to those, uh, let's say, mammals, depending on the different fences that you showed? Like you showed the tall fences, the porcupine fences. Like, uh, did you see like any sort of uh, a difference or in effect to the mammals? And preferably, uh, I think there are still many ranches that ideally fence their their lands. So would there be like uh, an advice like what sort of fences could be used or do you disagree like we don't need fences in these conservancies at all? Ramiro, can you take that? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Well, first Leo, like um, just make it clear that we didn't look directly into how animals uh, are being affected by those fences. And that's something we have been thinking, have some colleagues collecting data on giraffe movement. And we have some of the elephant movement and that we use there. And, and we want to start now that we have the fence layer. And the important thing here is we didn't have this information before. And I know a lot of people have been looking at, and by the way, all that, uh, all that information now is public and uh, any of you can access it if you want the Shafa. Um, and the, so we didn't look at now, it's something we want to do. But one of the things we've, we've noticed is that the fence gaps, so those structures where they build with, with, with poles and rocks, because the reality is when you have rhino, you need the fences to manage the rhinos. But if you increase it, like you put a lot of those structures the fence gap, the animals really use them. And there is a couple of good papers showing in Lewa how those gaps are being used. And actually, old Jovi, I think, has a really good, made a really good job. And I personally saw animals using those gaps a lot. So uh, I think that's probably one of the good solutions, increase the amount of those animal crosses uh, across the fences. And I will say, of course, the porcupine fence is one of seems to be one of the most effective. At more, a lot of the species can jump over, but elephants tend to avoid them because electricity, but even elephants are so good, that, especially bulls are breaking those. But I will say, I, I think that the porcupine fences are probably the most wildlife friendly. Of course, the tall fences stop everything. So nothing can really cross, cross them. And even within the porcupine fences, you have variety of them. How many wires? Sometimes they electrify wire and uh, feel uh, like really low. And apart in Oljogi, they have been successful in stopping lions crossing. All right, thank you. That's definitely an area that deserves more attention because we look at fences as, as all the same and clear, they are clearly not. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, I think Sharon is raising a hand again, you could unmute yourself and ask the question. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, just going back, okay, it's it's a two questions in one. I noticed in your presentation that uh, the gravy zebra and was it giraffe are not really making use of the west northwestern part of Laikipia up towards uh, Nyahuhuru. And I just uh, wondered if you would have an idea why the, that's, those species are not really uh, using that space. I found it interesting how the species are using different areas of Laikipia. So I, I just wanted to ask why do you think some are using, uh, some, are using um, more, some areas more than others? Because I, I, if, I'm not, if I'm not wrong, 
that area is a wildlife centered ranch. And my second question was, um, we're coming from an academic institution and we're very keen to have our students participate and be part of these kind of monitoring um, and research and data collection scenarios that you have across, well, like Ipia and Kenya and so on. And I wanted to ask your opinion, how would you involve the young people in learning how to collect this data in getting involved in the monitoring and also learning how to analyze this data so that they also become part of this research um, community. Thank you. Uh, I think I can take. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharon. Um, maybe to begin with, <clears throat> the gravies and the giraffes are not using the west side of, uh, of the Lycipia. Uh, that is not the case. It is only that the data that we, we, we projected there was for the colored individuals that we used in the analysis. However, we do have gravy zebra in Mugi and other ranches uh, within the western side of, of Laikipia and giraffes are also present in, in those sites. So this uh, concentration on the eastern side is because of the data that we used, not necessarily that they don't use those areas. Um, on the second uh, part, or the second question, the involvement of young people in this uh, kind of work, I think it's a very big uh, topic of discussion, and I'm very glad that uh, you have brought it forward, and I am really appreciative for, for your work as well. Um, I think there is so many avenues that we can brought in young people. The biggest challenge sometimes comes in terms of resources. However, young people also need to challenge themselves to engage in areas that they can also uh, volunteer, especially in the case of uh, this type of research, which is which may not mainly be readily available, but can give their services as interns uh, or as volunteers in some of these organizations that are really engaging uh, in this uh, deep research. I understand that is a big challenge. I've been a student in this country and I know how the problem is, but I think it also takes uh, everybody's uh, effort, your individual effort really matters in trying to access some of these opportunities. Right now, so many organizations, including the government organizations may not be able to take even students, uh, even for internship, but the more they continue to have to be, or rather the more they, these running institutions like the case of uh, Africa Nazarene, the more they continue to expose students to different areas where this work is being done, the more the students get the diverse uh, areas that they can apply to be engaged on. Uh, the biggest platform that is provided on training, like my colleague mentioned, they will be having uh, a training uh, in some Kenyan, uh, Kenyan students in the near future. Like myself, the way I met him was because of a similar training. So I would also encourage students to be on the lookout on all these uh, available opportunities online that they can be able to, to, to access and apply each and every position that they see that is relevant to their career. Otherwise there is, we, we, I cannot be able to guarantee that the, uh, everything will be on the table. I hope I uh, answered your question. I just wanted to add there, uh, also as I think as, um, as academics ourselves, we have a responsibility maybe to reach out to those communities and to be open to, to invest the time in helping and providing opportunities for those that search for. So you have like, you need two components, right? Like the students need to search for, and reach out and not be shy, shy, shy to reach out and send emails and look for, be active in looking for opportunities. And then for us, it's just best that time to provide those opportunities and to have calls or work, or work together, collaborate. And I think, yeah, I, I met Amos and I have seen 
more people here. Like I saw Anne there and I met Leo in at Impala. And all started with with a workshop that we gave at Impala three almost three years ago now. And that's how we started all these collaborations and working together. And uh, and yeah, and I think this it's really good that we can come as as communities together and work towards goals and with everybody contributing with its own expertise and everybody learning from each other. And I think that's a great way of doing this. And yeah, and Jerry is here in this call and with Jerry we have been trying to push for workshops uh, for training on this, more in the data analysis, more, more than in the data uh, collection part of it and always using open access software in a way that all these analyses we have done are with, all with open access software. So you don't need to pay to get access to the software, it's all free. And so and maybe one thing I need to do uh, is to make sure that whenever we have the course ready to advertise it, I pass it to you all so you can sh make sure you are there to, to be able to apply for it. Yeah. Um, thanks. Yeah, it will be great sharing such courses so that uh, Nature Kenya can easily distribute out or share out. Uh, I think there are more questions still in the chat by Charles Maindi. He is asking like whether there is any monitoring on those corridors across the ranches and uh, whether uh, you have ever overlaid the corridor data with refuge areas or watering points and if there is any influence uh, if there is any influence like sort of with the movement okay let's go with Charles questions first mm -hmm. Emma, you want to take that one um, no go ahead just a minute okay so the question is of creating barriers in wildlife areas, EMCA Act requires uh, environmental impact assessment reports as the barrier are concerned have diverse effects on the ecosystem. So it's more like a comment, right, Charles? I think that's correct. Mm. And yeah, I still ca coming from, a, from Argentina and working with a lot of companies and environmental impact assessments, you will know how those can go, right? So it's, I think what, one of the things I want to stress is that the main message, like it, it's really difficult to go from the analysis to actually action. And sometimes it's out of your hands. So we all play a role in the process. And our idea was always to provide information that can inform that process. But we also understand that it's extremely complicated. And, and also many of these areas are private properties. And there are, like Gipi, are historical colonial complexities and it's not really easy. And um, uh, many times depends on the, some of the actors. So one of the things we want to push here is to the idea that all the landowners start to think more on a regional perspective. So the strategy is here, if you keep thinking for your own property, you will end up with a big fence around your property and your animals won't be able to move anywhere. And then you will have to invest a lot to maintain those populations healthy because you, you know about inbreeding processes. And if you have a lot of inbreeding, then your populations are not available, available anymore. And then all these you know, populations will start to suffer and decrease and disappear. So for the good, the good of the entire animal community and people, we need to think regionally and not just from the small property perspective. So that's one of the things we are trying to push with these ideas of the Laikipia Conservancy Association and try to start those conversations. But these things happen in long periods of time. So it's kind of hard to have an effect, immediate, immediate effect. But let's see. I don't know if Aimo, you have something to add there from your experience working at Lois Ava or yeah, I think uh, addressing the question of Charles, have you overrated the corridor data with refuge areas of watering points and see if they influence the movement? I think that would have also been uh, important to tackle it. But um, to add on what you said, the main aim is to bring all the stakeholders together 
to ensure that we have a common goal. And I see some other comments indicating that uh, we need to bring even the county government on board and the county planners on board so that we can be able to access this information, which is very critical in terms of uh, landscape connectivity and uh, joining all these critical areas. So maybe you can tackle that one from Charles as well about uh, overlaying the data. Um, okay, well, okay, let me see. I, I don't know if I follow you there. Do you yeah, okay, just uh, to, let me just answer him direct. It's right on Charles Maingi. Uh, the thing is we, we haven't, uh, or rather in this particular analysis, we didn't consider uh, watering points because our aim was to identify the critical areas. If you look keenly on, on that data and the rivers, how they flow within Laikipia, that is the Ewaso, you realize there is that whole connectivity which could mean there is an influence of water. Uh, in that particular area. However, we didn't consider a uh, watering point in this case so much, but it is a critical thing that I understand needs to be considered. Additionally, there is a huge variation, especially on, on wildlife between Laikipia County for the time that I, that I was working there, between Laikipia and Samburu. Most of the wild animals will move all the way to Samburu and come back at one point, and that is seasonal uh, dependent. Specifically, the elephants would move very long distances in the whole county. So I think your point is uh, very clear. Uh, we need to uh, fine tune or rather do more uh, species specific or rather ranch specific analysis to identify the key or rather the influence of water in those uh, corridors or connected landscapes. Right. Um, and then there is another question. Uh, there are lots of questions in the chat. So, yeah. uh, okay, so I'll just try to read what I can see. So <laughs> from the areas identified for the priority conservation, uh, uh, what were the key landscape features identified that need enhancement? Okay, so just to take a little bit on that John question, uh, that's good. So let's see, from the area 75 for priority. So the key are fences, that's one of the main barriers. And then because we use the community as to the base information to create the resistance layers, that in the, the, the different explanatory variables there were distance to water that didn't play a main role on vegetation productivity and livestock abundance. And livestock abundance is one of the main reasons that you end up with, well, there are different problems, but if pastoralists cannot move and you have this, pro this process of sedentarization, then you have land degradation. And generally those degraded lands are the ones that animals avoid. So what you need to do is land restoration. So if you restore the land then um, decrease livestock at moderate numbers, then probably it's, I will expect the wildlife to start using those areas again. Um, does the circuitscape model relate to percolation model? I don't really know the answer to that. I don't really know what you mean by percolation. Um, John, um, will you be able for inv invitations for presentation to group or student and staff? I will be more than welcome to do that, yeah. Right. You have my email there in the presentation. I can put it here again. If you want to reach out or reach out to Amos as well. Okay. Uh, John, I uh, like uh, if John, like uh, if you can un unmute yourself and maybe just ask the last part of your question because uh, it wasn't clear to the presenters. All right. Uh, I think oh yeah, the, the question about Sndiwa, uh, about the lab set, that's actually super good and it's true that there's this big corridor that they are in this project of talking about um, how all these roads and rails are going to affect connectivity and it's going to cross right north to Laikipia, I believe, the plant I saw. 
And we didn't include in this paper and this analysis anything about roads. But one of the things that is probably going to happen pretty soon in Laikipia is the tarm being the, all the roads being tarmac. What is going to increase traffic a lot, especially that road that goes up on top of all Pejeta. So that's going to be another huge challenge. And we we talk about that in the paper, the need to continue doing this analysis. And here you see, like for, for the guys that are interested in this type of stuff, that it's a lot, a lot to, to do, a lot to keep doing. And we have been working on with some colleagues on creating certain tools to access linear infrastructure connectivity in a rapid manner. And um, yeah, I, 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 we'd be happy to, 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 to expand on that in another time. But yeah, definitely there's a big need to incorporate roads in Laikipia. At least some models try, try to predict how increasing traffic will affect all this connectivity and this landscape. And you see that the challenges keep mounting. It's going to be a lot, lot of work to do for you guys. All right. Uh, thank you so much for the great questions that have come through. Uh, I'm sorry if I didn't read out your question. Uh, you can always reach out. There is the mail of Greg uh, in the chat. And then Amos, you could also share your email right there so that if anyone has a question, they could reach out to you personally. So I'm really grateful to all of you for joining this uh, interesting talk. Um, just one uh, announcement. Uh, Nature Kenya is recruiting new members. So if you're not a member of Nature Kenya, we highly encourage you to join Nature Kenya and uh, just be a member. And then I don't know if Juliet wants to mention something briefly about that before I welcome Simon Silla to give the parting remarks. Uh, just a minute. Uh, okay, you know, I think there is a, a question that uh, we didn't tackle okay. from Jaika. And uh, he says, good job. Were the species diversity present in area put into consideration in the study? Putting in mind the predator prey relationships, species specific movement patterns, endangered species protection, what kind of connectivity corridors would be recommended for such a vast area? So I think we didn't uh, tackle that. <laughs> However, I'll just uh, uh, say that in our analysis, we were looking at the aerial surveys, which, which, uh, which is already conducted uh, by the Department of Remote Sensing, and that's the data we used. We know the movement patterns of uh, the herbivores can be dictated by, by the carnivores as well. However, we were looking at how we can maintain even the connectivities, uh, even the connectivity of these uh, predators as well. Therefore, uh, we didn't factor in like prey species interactions as a key thing in this analysis, provided the species occurs within a given area. And uh, the protection of the endangered species like rhinos, I think. Ramiro mentioned about uh, the issue of old jogi and the fencing to protect the key uh, endangered species. He also mentioned about Loisaba. So those are some of uh, the advancement or rather the, the, what do you call it? Like advancement of these conservancies to increase their security and their own management of these wildlife species. And therefore that is uh, the, the main aim here is to look at the whole connectivity and how we can open up, even when we have endangered species, and be able to roam around those areas. <clears throat> right. It's the same connectivity we need. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Julia, do you want to mention something about membership before we hand it over to Msila? I think I'll help Julia Juliet on that. Okay. Yes, I would just like to, okay, most of the people who have joined us today are members of Nature Kenya, but there are a few who have, have seen they're not our members, so we'll just well, like to. Sorry, Juliet, I'll just tackle the question. So, 
Yeah, so we welcome those who are not members of Nature Kenya. You can write to us directly. Yeah, yeah, just... membership. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about Juliet. That's Juliet. I think I'll just tackle the question. So those who are not members of Nature Kenya, I'll share an email address where you can just write to us directly or call us. And then we'll take you through the process of becoming a member of Nature Kenya. And those who are also not members of the Mammal Committee, you're also welcome to join in and become members of the Mammal Committee. You can do that after you're a member of Nature Kenya. I also take this opportunity to remind our members that we have our AGM on the 19th of May, starting at 10 a.m. It is a virtual AGM and uh, details of the of joining the meeting have been sent to your email we'll keep reminding you so we welcome you to take time and join the agm it's very important for us for your your, your presence is very important to us thank you all right it's my pleasure to welcome simon msila the head of mammalogy section and also our patron for the mammal committee Thank you very much, um, Leo, the chair. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. I think my, my voice is not splitting like uh, that one of Amos Chege. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Chege and uh, Dr. Ramiro, for finding time to come to speak to us about, uh, about landscape and connectivity. Uh, long time, Chege, to meet, uh, meeting you. Thank you so yes. much for coming to talk to us. Also, Dr. Ramiro, um, the MAMO committee is actually a group of people who are interested in conservation of mammals, and uh, we invite everybody because we think that uh, this is something that we have to do with everybody. Um, maybe to comment on the landscape and connectivity, actually this issue has been with us for a very long time. I think since the conservation areas were designated in Kenya. But I think it, it seems like we are losing the battle because I'm not aware of any place where we have been able to try to connect either protect areas or in the, 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 the ranches. Um, Joan and I think even Ogutu and also the Ministry of Environment came up with a report, very detailed report actually, where they showed where connectivity has to be done, like the part of Amboseli and the um, and, uh, South Coast. Yeah, it's a huge, there's a huge report on the same, but um, the government of Kenya, we have not been able to do. Maybe probably the people who are in uh, working in NGOs like Chege, Nature Kenya, everybody, this is something we have to lobby. Otherwise we are going to lose animals as we talk about them with our good data. Mm -hmm. um, I want to thank the, all the participants. We, we had a, a big team. The, the, the maximum was 57 of them. And uh, up to now, even when towards the end, we have 48, which is good. Eh? We need to maintain that momentum. And uh, yeah, so I would like to thank all, all of them for, um, for coming. And this is a platform where we will continue talking about mammals and also acting about any conservation activities that we need to save them. I was impressed by the issues about publishing. Yeah, um, Africa and even Kenya, um, researchers, we haven't really done a lot of publishing. And, and this is because we are limited by the, the facilities to do that, equipment. We're also limited by the tools that we can use to analyze data. So probably Ramiro and other uh, and his team from abroad, <laughs> this is where we can actually work together so that we can um, tackle those bottlenecks and probably we can improve on how much we can publish. So I think yeah. that's a challenge. I think if we work together, I'm sure so many people would really improve on what they can report. Um, I also want to, to, to tell members that uh, the committee, the MAMO committee, has, has published or launched an app, a mobile-based app. We are calling it uh, Makenya. This is an application that, that you can actually download from the Play Store, Google Play Store, and then you can load it in your phone. And then when you're in the field and you see any, any MAMO, you can actually repeat it. 
And this probably will help uh, Ramiro and uh, Chege in 50 years in, in, to come, because this data is, is very important. So if, if 44 members of the members are so yeah, they can join and uh, probably when they go out in the field and it's really checking now because he's a field person, that would be very helpful to build on to what kind of uh, sighting that can come through. So I'm very grateful for the presenters and the participants. I'm also very grateful to, to Nature Kenya for setting up this platform and also making this come to, to pass. Thanks so much, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Simon. All right. Thank you. I think we've come to the end of our talk today. Thank you, everyone. Leo, Leo quickly, before you close, uh, I would like to mention to the members that we also have a publication by the Plants Committee. They have a guide for plants of City Park, which is available at the Nature Kenya shop at 650. And also the Succulenta uh, of East Africa have also published a booklet on alloys in the garden an identity parade at 9.50 at the Nature Kenya shop. So you can contact our membership office through the contacts that Gloria already provided. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. See you next month for the next talk. Asante. Thank you so much, guys. Pleasure and really nice to, to be with you all. Pleasure to meet you all this afternoon. Simon, we should talk later like, someday. Yeah, we should. We should go to. <laughs>